Thanks for joining us on News at 10. This bulletin is coming to you live from our studios here at Adesawe and uh, Accra. We can now, uh, we, you can now hear us uh, also on 3 from night, 2.7 FM. Let's uh, first take a look at the news highlights for the day. President Kufuado says, the Tuabu gas plant is critical in transforming the economy from an agrarian-based raw material producing one to an industrial value added economy. He made the observation on his visit to familiarize himself with the operations of the company. And Vice President Dr. Mahaba Dubaumia says the Bank of Ghana should ensure declining policy rates is transmitted to lending rates by commercial banks in the country. He said the financial sector must play its responsible role to ensure the private sector accesses affordable credit. And the victim in Tuesday's Alaju shooting incident, Richard Yao Buedi, has died after hours battling for his life at the intensive care unit of the Ridge Hospital in Accra. The sad event occurred Wednesday evening uh, when TV3 has learned. Meanwhile, the suspect has been remanded by the Abeka Magistrates Court. And the Controller and Accountant General's Department was unable to account for total proceeds of 10% salary cuts of the appointees of former President John Mahama for the year 2015. Appearing before the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, Deputy Controller Kwesi Owusu disclosed government through the Chief of Staff requested the amount accrued in 2014. The Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwifery Association has welcomed the introduction of the quota system in nursing and midwifery training institutions. National President of the Association, Kwesi Asante Krobia, says this would address the shortfalls in the qualitative training of health professionals. Those were our major news highlights. Remember, we're streaming live on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. You can also hear us on 3FM 92.7. Welcome back. Now, the victim in Tuesday's Alaju shooting incident, Richard Yaobwede, has died after hours battling for his life at the intensive care unit of the Rich Hospital. The sad event occurred Wednesday evening. TV3 has learned. Richard Yaobwede was shot at close range by the suspect, Charles Nana Frimpon, during a scaffold at a garage at Alaju. The suspect, Charles, pulled a foreign pistol after the mechanics have helped to separate him and the torture driver and fired a warning shot. The second attempt went straight into the lower abdomen of the deceased, Richard Yabwedi, rupturing his intestine and kidney. <laughs> Doctors at the Accra Regional Hospital managed to operate on him. It's in the hands of the intensive care doctors, but uh, his condition is delicate. But the chances of survival, we can't categorically say. As I said, his condition is critical. And we are doing our best to save him. However, Richard failed to survive after hours on life support. Suspect Charles Anafrimpon was remanded into police custody by an Abekan magistrate court to reappear on Monday, August 14. Let's uh, get onto the telephone and speak with the security uh, and safety and international relations expert Adam Bona, who is uh, with more than 20 years of experience in counter-terrorism, defense and intelligence uh, to delve deep into this. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you extremely for your time. 
Yes, good evening. Good evening to, to you, uh, Stephen. Mm. So this incident is pretty sad, but we would like to know what your general reaction is, especially in an incident where uh, a young man, an innocent young man standing by was shot dead due to uh, provocation from somebody who was carrying a weapon. Yes, uh, thank, you, thank you once again and thank you to your viewers. Uh, my condolences, uh, deepest condolences to the bereaved family. I think uh, news, uh, you know, just came in, is, is passed on. And no one should die this way. And so my initial reaction would be, as a nation, uh, we let our leaders to put in measures to make sure uh, you know, people go about their, you know, duties, go about whatever they want to do freely without fear nor intimidation. Uh, but unfortunately, we seem to, uh, we've had too many of these incidents where innocent people have lost their lives. And uh, most often, uh, most of these things go on and uh, probably... Uh, we don't have much uh, first investigations are not done the way they should be done. And so what happens is that uh, most of these people are set free. And so I'm hoping that the, the police investigators, the crime scene investigators, I had, uh, I think on the day, I had uh, my good friend uh, Kosifori speak and uh, said that the uh, forensic crime scene, forensic aspects have come there to take some you know, to, to begin initial investigations. And so th those would be some of my initial uh, reaction. Mm. In, uh, but mm. I know that information uh, I have also picked indicate that uh, he is a licensed gun owner. But that's another thing I'm sure we are going to be discussing. Exactly. That's, that's uh, something I would like to actually delve into, whether licensed or not. Do you get the impression that this is one instance which should make us begin to re-evaluate uh, the licensing regime? For example, perhaps we could introduce elements of a mental state of applicants? Yes, if you look at the firearm acquisition procedure, uh, they, they, there are, you know, a couple of uh, steps. First of all, you have to be 18 and above, and you have to be, you know, physically fit. That's what it says. You have to be mentally sound. You don't have to be someone who is known by the police. And when they say you shouldn't be known by the police, it means that you shouldn't have had any records of uh, criminality or shouldn't have been That's convicted right. by any court, uh, either in this country or outside this country. And then, then you know, uh, one of the things that we must, the people must must know, or I mean, we, we, we should learn, is that uh, we, 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 there, there, there is a, a cumbersome way of, you know, acquiring a firearm, but unfortunately, uh, you know, things, the way things are done in this country, you want to acquire a firearm today, and the next day, once you have your money, you are going to, you know, be offered a firearm with something that looks like a permit or a license to own a firearm. Within the same acquisition, you know, procedure, it says that you have to, I mean, you have to, you know, if you go to most of the police stations, they, they have, in fact, they have a division or an office that deals with, you know, licensing, you know, uh, firearms. And so you would have to go there, talk to them. They have to do all their evaluations. Once they are done, they give you uh, the initial permit space of six months. Within the six months, if you have not purchased or owned the firearm, you, have, you lose it. You have to reapply. But if within that period you happen to have acquired the said firearm, uh, you know, you are granted a one-year renewable license, then you have to be renewing it. If you wait for it to elapse, it means that you lose uh, the license, you, and so you are not permitted to own a firearm. Mm. And that is another thing. And so I'm sure uh, as uh, we proceed, we probably would be educating the public and we, 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 we would be informing the public about what mm. we must know and what we shouldn't do, uh, you know, so that we don't... From, 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 from where you stand and from your expertise, looking at this particular incident, would you say we are safe as a people in the hands of uh, those who are licensed to carry weapons? Well, let me, let me, let me just uh, say, you know, uh, bluntly, uh, at all, we 
are not. Uh, and at the moment, if you probably uh, you go to the police records and you want the information, you are going to get the information. But also remember that when there is one regime change, what happens is that most people are drafted into uh, some of these uh, services, DNI, IDNI, National Security, and the rest. And so you would have people who probably might be licensed to, uh, you know, own a firearm, but probably they haven't been trained. One of the things that uh, probably we, sh we, we are not doing is letting people know that it is only cowards who would discharge a firearm when they are provoked. Under extreme provocation, even if they are licensed gun owner, right. you are not supposed to discharge a firearm. And so... Uh, we are not safe, and uh, Stephen, I have to let you know, I'm sure you might, you might have that information. We have more than 1.5 million illegal firearms in the hands of people. Let me also put on record that we have less than 30,000 policemen currently in this country. But some of these police officers, about a quarter of them or more, are not uniformed police officers. Some of them are on international duties. Some of them are on guard duty. Some of them are, you know, drivers, whatever. You put all of them together, you have less than 30,000. And so when you add the military and the rest of them, we have less than 150,000 state security officers. Right. Uh, Mr. Bona, we're grateful for our time. Adam Bona is a safety expert and a security analyst. Uh, you heard him there. This is News at 10. We're live on TV3 and also on 3FM 92.7. We have more news for you. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, Dr. Valerie Sawyer's comments uh, in an article where she expressed outrage at former President Rawlings and former Attorney General Martin Amidu for their consistent criticism of the NDC uh, have opened fresh wounds in the party. Other members of the party have responded to Dr. Valerie Sawyer's comments. Uh, the former Deputy Chief of Staff, Dr. Valerie Sawyer, said in an article that former President Rawlings was prepared to destroy anyone and anything in the NDC if that will suit his agenda to be in the driving seat. She also accused former Attorney General Martin Amidu of sabotaging the party in the last elections. According to her, the former Attorney General must resign from the party since he has achieved his aim of sending the party into opposition. Additionally, a member of the NDC, Al Haji Baturi, has called on the party to sack its founder, Jerry John Rollins, for his comment he made before and after the last elections. Al Haji Baturi wants the NDC to demonstrate that nobody is beyond discipline in the political party, given it has sanctioned high ranking members in the past. A former member of parliament, Michael T. Nyahunu, is upset over Valerie Sawyer's attacks on the NDC's founder, Jerry John Rollins. To him, it is insulting and shameful for someone with no deep roots in the NDC to attack the party's founder. Former Attorney General Martin Amidu also says the article by former Deputy Chief of Staff Dr. Valerie Sawyer was incoherent, disjointed and full of lies. Another NDC member, De La Kofi, in an article questioned the motivation for Dr. Valai Sawyer's article, which has sparked controversy. Let's get on to the telephone lines now and speak with uh, Michael Tay Nyauno, who is the former NDC MP for Lower Mania Krobo uh, constituency. He's on the line now. Good evening, Honorable, and we're grateful you could join us. You, I know you may have read the article by uh, Dr. Sawyer, who questioning why the founder and former president, J.J. Uh, Rawlings, had, uh, had found, have found time to accuse NDC of corruption, but see nothing wrong with the MPP seven months administration. You see the article as disgraceful? Yeah, thank you very much. And good evening. Uh, yes, I really saw the article as very disgraceful and very disappointing. And as a matter of fact, very insulting. Uh, I said this because I don't think where we have reached now 
this thing should be happening in the party. I really don't know what uh, informed Asaki to put uh, Dr. Warsoya to article into the uh, into the public domain like this. Uh, if not, maybe play an agenda for herself or for any other person. I don't see really see that. I don't see any motivation that should bring that in. Mm, but all. don't you don't you see any substance at all in? some of the issues she brought forward. I mean, she's, she raised specific concerns about the former president attacking everything and pushing the party down further, despite the party remaining in opposition. Some of these things, although came out as emotional outbursts, were factual. Now, the issue I think is, is it true that Rowling did that? And is it, according to her, the intention was to bring the party down so that when the party is down, then he cannot take over and control the party. The issue is the matters that he rose, uh, Jerry was talking about, are they true or not true? For me, that is what is supposed to be considered. Is, it, uh, is there corruption going on so high or not? Or at least just fabricated some stories and put in the public domain? That is my worry. The position as President Rollins reached as a founder of the party and former head of state, he, it has, he has gained a certain height that we have not been able to get to that level. So certainly he will see things that we don't see. And for me, when he raises issues like that, we have to go and investigate and see right. whether these things are true or not true and then try to address them accordingly. Right, Honorable, uh, we're grateful for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Michael Te. Nyauno is a former member of Parliament. Let's go on to Skype now. We do have uh, Ko Kweja joining us now. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you. We're grateful for your time. So I know that two members of the NDC party uh, have written to the attorney, have to the former Attorney General and uh, former President requesting that they be suspended. The two former members have requested that these two uh, leading members of the party be suspended. Would you say this is actually an indication of cracks within the ranks of the M NDC? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Steve, for having me. I would say that I don't necessarily see it as a crack actually, but to say that party pickings are normal, especially for opposition parties, um, a party mm -hmm. that has lost power uh, and is in opposition. I mean, uh, it, is, it is normal for, for people to be disgruntled, and, you know, people to write and say all sorts of things, accuse each other and uh, put uh, unpleasant information out there. And we have witnessed this in the MPP when, when they lost power. I mean, uh, we remember of the, 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 what uh, Dr. Ata Kennedy wrote and all that. I wouldn't necessarily say it is a crack, actually. More, more so, I would say that it will depend on how the party handles it. That will, that will, that will actually turn into a crack or not. Of course, um, every party expects that members will rally behind the party. And so when when there are members who are always criticizing the party, who mm. seem to be against the core leadership of the party, people will definitely take up this uh, this uh, um, uh, this kind of uh, disposition. And I, I am particularly not surprised about the petition about uh, Martin Amidu. Mm. Are, you, are you also not uh, concerned? I mean, as an analyst, uh, I know that you possibly understand that the NDC uh, might be digesting the contents of the uh, Butcher report. So on the face of that, as they're going about doing this, and then there's Rawlings, Mahama factions within the party also raising their voices and uh, more like muddying the waters. Do you think this is going to hurt the NDC? Definitely, yes, it will. Um, let me let me say that, um, and I think I have I have said it on this on this platform before, that the Kosibuche report does not actually speak to what the likes of Rawlings would want to see in the party, and what what they would want to see in the party is a total overhaul of the leadership structure, mm. 
And when you look at the Constitutional Report, it, it talks about reorganizing the party from the roots. It doesn't actually look at the leadership structure. And so when you, when you listen to the, the, um, uh, the speeches of Rollins, Martin Amidou, and the rest, you see that they are, they are hammering on the issue of corruption, whether, whether perceptive or actual. That is, that is their uh, you know, that is their issue. And they tilt it towards the leadership because that is what they they are looking for. And so, um, for them, for them implementing implementing the recommendation of the Constitutional Court report will, will 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 be enough when they are able to see a, a total overhaul of the leadership structure. However, if you analyze the report very well, you realize that they. Uh, the committee actually did not want to give any head start to anybody who would want to be part of the new leadership, you know, when it comes to the, the, the new election that the party will be, you know, you know will be, will be under, undergoing. And so basically, um, it is going to hurt the party. The party will never come out the same. Um, when you look at how some people have hooked on onto the, the, the initial article by uh, Dr. Sawyer, and when you listen to the other comments that others are giving in favor of Rollins, and even when you listen to the new article by Martin Amidou, you realize that, yes, um, people will be hurt, people will not come out the right. same, and it will, it will be very difficult for the party to, you know, um, go the way that they wanted to go. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Cole. Kweja Emisa for joining us on Skype. Uh, Mr. Emisa Abraham is the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Research and Training at the University of Cape Coast. Now, away from that, the Minister of Education says he'll submit uh, fees from 25 public institutions to Parliament for approval. Dr. Matthew Boku Prempe has therefore warned the remaining institutions not to change, charge any new fees or risk incurring the displeasure of Parliament. Some public tertiary institutions have indicated plans to charge higher fees despite warnings by the National Council for Tertiary Education. The University Students Association of Ghana, USAC, requested students not to pay unapproved fees. The Education Minister, Dr. Matsu Poko Prempe, insists the institutions should await parliamentary approval. Approval authority in the constitutional era is the uh, Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Right. So what you suggest Parliament might increase it. What you suggest, Parliament might retain it. What you suggest, Parliament might decrease it. So far, 25 public tertiary institutions have submitted their fees to Ministry for onward submission to Parliament. In the interim, you charge what you are doing last year uh, so that you don't second guess Parliament. Parliament takes a dim view of people who want to make it a rubber stamp. Meanwhile, the Minister of Education has sworn in the new governing councils for the University of Energy and Natural Sciences and the University of Professional Studies, UPSC. The councils are also mandated to maintain a peaceful academic environment. And the Deputy Finance Minister, Abina Osei Esari, has disclosed that out of the 26,000 public sector workers whose names were struck out for failing to do the validation, 23,000 have been duly validated and back on the payroll. She was answering questions at the Public Accounts Committee sitting in Parliament on Wednesday. Well, so you mean to say... We gave some timelines and... We said, if by this time all workers haven't done that, we will go ahead and then take their names off the payroll until they do it, and then we'll get their names back on the payroll. And Mr. Chairman, I believe it's it, it helped in several ways. For you, the worker, it will make it simpler and easier, uh, should you retire, for them to be able to better assess your retirement benefits. and. Um, in a way, to we were able to, I mean, establish the actual the, the actual number was twenty six thousand, and um, we are still left with about three thousand that are yet to do the biometric. So we are not saying they are ghost names, but we wanted the right thing to be done. And moving forward, what we are saying is that we want to bring checks and balances in the payroll system. We want you to help us. We also want to help you. So let's all 
do the biometric. Once we do the biometric, we'll be in a better position to serve this nation better. And that's how we draw the curtain for News at 10. Thank you for making time for us. And thanks for those of you who tune in to 3 from 92.7. Thank you for leaving your dial there. I'm Stephen Enti. On behalf of the rest of the crew, good night.